Um, you're now broadcasting to all attendees. <laughs> hello, hello. Welcome from Tel Aviv. We're going to get going in just a minute or two. Let the clock switch over to 8 p.m. Israel time. <laughs> Here with Shmulek, our mammal expert, director of our mammal center. I'll introduce you more formally in a second. Wait for people to, to click on here on our evening content from Jerusalem and actually not from Jerusalem, from the Jerusalem Hills, from Tel Aviv and from Modi'in, broadcast by Lawrence Kazmir from his home in Modi'in. I'm Jay Shofet here in Tel Aviv. Shmulek Idvav is with us from his home in the Jerusalem Hills. Shmulek is still working out in the fields. We can be jealous. Uh, and uh, we're going to get going uh, just about now. Welcome, welcome, all of you, hundreds of you who are joining on Zoom and on Facebook from around the world, around Israel. Great to hear from you all. Many of you probably joined us for Jonathan Mayrav and a uh, fascinating talk on birding in Israel last week. We have more great talks coming up. You'll, you've received some mails on that. And Please forward them to anybody who you'd like or let us know if we can put anybody else on the mailing list. Happy to have people join Chevra uh, Lagarata Teva, the Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel. We are broadcasting uh, from our homes to bring a little bit of Israeli nature into yours. Tonight we're with Shmulek, the director of our Mammal Center. Shmulek is going to give us an overview of the secret life of Israeli mammals. He's going to concentrate on four of our flagship species species in general that SPNI works with, and I think some of the coolest species we work with. Uh, really excited to have Shmulek with us tonight. Thank you again, Lawrence, for uh, all the back office support and uh, for Yael, who's been helping with this all along. And uh, we are now underway. Take it away, Shmulek, from the Jerusalem Hills. I'll just share the screen. It will take a second. If I'm allowed to do so. Okay, so let's start uh, and forgive my English, which is uh, learned in school and not from my house. So uh, if uh, something is not understood, then uh, just tell, chat, and let me know. Okay, so uh, hi, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, each, each one in, each, in, in his own time. I'm going to tell about a little bit about the wild mammals of uh, Israel. Um, I'm running the Information Center of Mammals for the Society of Protection of Nature in Israel, and I'm doing it for the past seven years. I live in uh, Jeruz New Jerusalem, actually, in Su Adassa, and uh, I'm a zoologist, ecologist and a zoologist. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert for anything. An expert is uh, after that. Before that, we are just learning all the time. So hopefully one day I'll be recognized as an expert, but not at the moment, unfortunately. So a little bit about uh, our location, about Israel. Israel is a very uh, small and very strange country. We are tiny in size, but we are in the middle between three large continents, Africa, Africa, Asia, and Europe. And we are just in the middle between these three continents. And we are influenced by uh, these three continents by uh, uh, mammal, by animals, sorry, by fauna and by flora, by plants. And we can see a representative of all these three continents in Israel. Our climate is also very uh, strange. If you uh, see the broadcast at the night uh, television news, you'll see that uh, we have a list, a long list for such a small country of a different temperature in different places. And it's quite strange to see that in such a tiny area, but we, you have to remember, we have got the Hermon Mountain, which is now we covered with snow. That's from one end. And from the other end, we've got a lot, which is quite hot at this time of the season. And all this is just a few hours traveling by car, not even by plane. We have a large diversity of almost everything, and we'll see it in a minute. And we have a very, very unique history, a live history, which is uh, currently also undergoing. 
So a little bit about, for example, the climate. We have the influence of Mediterranean, Mediterranean climates. We've got the uh, influence of Iran or Turani, meaning from Asia, Central Asia climate. We have deserts, you probably all know it. Israel is known for its desert, but actually deserts are not covering all the size of the country, only part of it. And we've got also influence by a, a, a sort of a climate and also a look of Ethiopian and uh, Sudanese area, which are on the eastern part of uh, the continent of Africa. This is all uh, represented by our ecological system in Israel. And you can see a map, you don't have to, of course, understand each color, but you can see how diverse the ecological system in Israel are. And everything is by a short distance of uh, traveling, hiking even, and you can cross Israel from west to east in only a two hours drive a bit in a, in, and even less. And you can walk it in a, maybe a day or two and you can move from one area to another area which is completely different from coastal sands on the west to a very harsh desert in the east and all that in very few hours or even, uh, even less. Also our history is very diverse. We have influence of human beings here for the past many thousands of years. You can see it on the environment. You can see it, for example, on the terraces on the hills of Jerusalem where I live, terraces which were built by ancient people in the past few thousand years. Each one developed his own terrace, his own platform in order to raise crops. And by talking about crops, we are also talking about uh, plants that were uh, brought into the country from other sometimes continents, neighboring countries, which are not native to this region. We can also see that uh, many, ma many animals were domesticated in this region. Some of these uh, animals also took place uh, and, uh, and even, even uh, managed to push away animals which are native, mammals or uh, other animals which are native and wild born in this country were pushed away by uh, animals which were domesticated here. And we can see also the influence of human beings, like hunting uh, of uh, some of the animals, some to extinction, some others just to other places in uh, remote places in Israel. And this influence is uh, still going on and even maybe intensified in the past 100 years, especially since uh, uh, firearms were brought into the country and of course uh, managed to influence a lot of the animals which are extinct when these firearms were presented in, in our uh, location. So the result is that we are a, a, have a very diverse um, fauna, not only the flora, plants, but also fauna. For example, 1% of each of the reptiles in the world known to science are found in Israel. We have more than 100 species of reptile in Israel. One out of 100 known to human beings in the world are presented here in Israel. That's a lot. It's snakes and uh, lizards and uh, tortoises, and it's quite uh, fun for those who are uh, pathologists, love reptiles, to come to Israel and see all these uh, animals. The number of birds, we already discussed it with uh, last week. We have uh, many, many species of birds, which are not only, uh, the, the amount is not only the one who counts, but also the amount per size. For such a small country, we have more than eight, triple by eight, the species of uh, birds that you can see in Great Britain. And I cannot even compare it to Germany, where we also, we have more than 20, uh, multiplied by 20, the amount of birds which are, come, uh, which are presented in Israel. And only today I returned from the north of the country where a species which is known only in, in South Africa was found in uh, one of the pools at the coastal uh, uh, near the sea near the sea of uh, uh, Mayan Svit called uh, Kibbutz, which is not far from the city of Caesarea. Uh, we have also 33 species of bats in Israel, and you can compare it to Great Britain, for example, which have only 19 species of bats. And if you compare it to the whole of Europe, in all of Europe, the whole continent of Europe has only about 40 species of bats. So for people who like bats, for example, it's, it's just paradise to come to Israel, visit Israel, and see all the amount of those species which are uh, unique, and I'll tell it in a in few seconds. So talking about the mammals of Israel, we have about 100 species of mammals, 
and why do I say about? I suppose supposed to be a, an expert and know everything about the mammals, but we don't know. Uh, we have about 100 species of mammals in Israel, uh, and, it's, and it's about because some of the species we know that used to live here, we are not sure if they still exist. And from, from the other point of view, we have some species which were uh, uh, recently uh, separated from known species into new species. So we have changes all the time, but approximately we have about 100 species of mammals in Israel. These species representing different ecosystems and different continents. We can find animals which the uh, southern, most southern uh, distribution is in Israel. And from the other end, species which the most northern distribution is also found in Israel. And sometimes we can find them in the same place. So we can find here animals which are desert dwellers and others which are Mediterranean and even some which uh, represent Alps. The Alps in, the, in Europe love uh, a cold weather and a harsh environment in terms of cold and, uh, um, and the attitude. And uh, uh, we can find them also uh, in sometimes very close distance from each other. All but one, of the species are, categor are categorized by the IUCN. IUCN is the International Union for Conservation of Nature, a body which is uh, under responsibility of uh, the UN, and uh, the sort of a categorized system in order to give those uh, decision makers, which uh, aim to uh, preserve animals, a sort of a category uh, to know which animals in, uh, is uh, under what kind of a risk. And uh, all our animals in Israel, all our mammals in Israel, all but one are categorized in one way or another from least concern to extremely endangered or critically endangered by the IUCN. If we are looking at the, uh, the local perspective, 61 out of the 100 species are in high extinction risk locally. Meaning for example, that leopards, if they do exist or not, we are not really sure yet, but they are highly endangered. And other species are also, in some, in some cases, and we'll see some of these uh, examples, uh, if we don't act now, those species will not survive for the next generation. So uh, what, are, what am I going to do and talk uh, with you the next uh, 30, 35 minutes? I'm going to tell the stories of three species and one group of mammals. And these species are the Persian fellow deer, the one that you can see now on the left here. Uh, we are going to talk also about the mountain turtle, which is also very uh, unique in Israel, European river otter, and the whole group of bears. So um, bear a few minutes with me, and uh, I hope that uh, you'll have fun knowing these uh, very amazing creatures in my, in my own uh, way. So uh, the first one is the Persian fellow deer. The Latin name uh, or the scientific name is Dama Mesopotamica. This is one of three deers that used to live in Israel, which are known to us from the Bible to our own era and period. Uh, we know that they existed here because many travelers like Henry Tristram, an Anglican priest, which was also a zoologist, visited our land between 1963 and 18, sorry, 1863 and 1864. And he wrote several books about the fauna of Palestine, at that time known as Palestine. We have to remember it was during the Ottoman period, during the Turkish uh, uh, control of the, of the country. And this uh, priest visited uh, uh, our region, not only Palestine, but also Jordan and Lebanon, and he, uh, at, the, at that time, uh, zoologists like him used to uh, see, shoot, and stuff, meaning they used to see the animals using local guides, like you can see here, then shoot them and preserve them in order to uh, show them for demonstration in uh, museums all over the world. And uh, Henry Becker Tristram told us the story about the local fauna of our region during the 18th century, the 19th century, sorry. So at that time, for example, he saw two types or two species of deers. One of them was the Persian fellow deer and he described one not from Tiberius, but there was also another small deer, which also extinct later on, which is the roe deer. But he didn't see another uh, species of deer 
which uh, uh, probably extinct during the Crusader time, and that was the red deer. We know that this species used to exist because we found bones, we found skeletons, so we can know and see who, uh, what are the animals who lived there. So, the uh, um, system did not hunt any patient for this, but it did some skulls and some uh, antlers, and some are still presented in the museum, like the Museum for Zoology. Uh, and uh, um, he was probably the only uh, one that gave, uh, the, only, the last one who gave evidence about the presence of these animals in Israel, because later on, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, people did not see Persian fellow deers anymore, and they were considered as extinct completely, not only from our region, but also from the whole world as, it, as we know it. But uh, about 50 years later, just uh, right after the Second World War, a different uh, situation was occurred. Now, why do I put this picture of Persian fellow deers next to the symbol of the car manufactured opal? Because the Baron von Opel was an owner of uh, the car company and also a zoologist, which also had a zoo in Kronberg, Germany, heard that in Iran, at around the 1950s, someone told him that he saw in Iran Persian fellow deers in Iran. So the Baron von Opel, of course, to Iran, a close friend of Israel, and collected few deers from uh, local uh, zoos which belonged to the Shah, the king of Iran. So he brought those animals back to his uh, estate in Kronberg, Germany, managed to breed them and spread them to other zoos, and suddenly the species rise from the deads and people knew that he still exists. Now I'm jumping to a, a different era Israel was established in 1948, as you know, and uh, in the first years it struggled just to, to live. No conservations, no, no one thought about conservation of animals, of land, of nature reserve. Just let's stay alive and fight all our, all our enemies. But later on, people started to think, okay, now we are a modernized country. We managed to survive. Let's think about conservation, the SPNI was uh, uh, um, established later on the Nature and Park Authority. And people started to think, okay, let's try and bring animals that were mentioned in the Bible back to, to the wild, meaning reintroduction. And the first animal which was chosen was the Persian fellow deers. Why they were chosen? Because they were the last to extinct. They should be the first one to be reintroduced. Now, this is a very strange story. I have to admit that when I read it, I did not really believe it, but uh, um, it, the story goes like that. The Shah of Iran, which was a monarch, a uh, real dictator, let's say it, in Iran, had his brother uh, to be in charge for conservation. And his brother was sent to Israel to learn from his friends, at the Nature and Park Authority, how to do conservation. Everyone knew at the world at that time that Israel managed to protect the ibex and the gazelle, which were extinct in other countries around them, but they managed to, we managed to, to keep them uh, uh, alive. And he wanted to learn how to do so. So the brother of uh, uh, the Shah of Iran uh, came to Israel, learned from his um, uh, friends here from the Nature and Park Authority members how to do conservation. He was really impressed and he wanted to uh, uh, give a sort of uh, a gift to his uh, um, hosts. And how did he thought to do it? He, he suggested them to have Cadillac cows as a gift. And why do I don't believe this story? Is because uh, uh, the answer that came from uh, his host was, don't give us Cadillacs, please bring us some Persian fellow deers. Now a typical Israeli would ask a Cadillac and a deer inside the Cadillac, but not that's the official story. That was not the official story. The official story says, skip the Cadillacs, bring us deers. And this is uh, to make the, short, the, the long story short, only at uh, the last days of uh, the Shah of Iran regime, in 1978, the plane, a plane uh, owned by El Al flew from Tehran carrying the last uh, passengers from the Israeli embassy, the most uh, uh, um, secret uh, equipment that the embassy had, and also four deers back to Israel. And from four, four deers, 
Now there are more than 300 deers in Israel spread between uh, the Chaibar Preserve in the north, belong to the Nature and Park Authority, and the, the Jerusalem Zoo in the hills of Jerusalem. And this population in, uh, became larger enough in order to uh, allow to do the introduction project. And it started in 1996 in the uh, Western Galilee, where the first animals were uh, represented back to the wild. And uh, now we are more than 25 years, or almost 25 years from that, 21 years actually, to be correct, 20 years, 21 years from the uh, start point of the reintroduction project. And today, this reintroduction project is quite extensive and quite large. It's been uh, researched and tracked by supervisors, both from the academy, from the SPNI, and from the Nature and Park Authority. All the animals are being tracked, known to know, we know where they are, at least at the first year or two before uh, the callers stop uh, uh, giving us information. You can see that uh, there is a young man with a collar, a young girl with a collar, the others are also wearing collars. But you cannot see that. This is one of the researchers. And today, uh, if we start with, we, when we started with it, it was with radio monitoring, meaning we have to go with an uh, antenna and try to locate the animals. Today we are using GPS uh, collars, which give you accurate uh, location. You don't have to go from your sofa in order to know where the, uh, where the uh, patient fellow is right there at the moment. Today, the project is uh, quite successful. There is a very large uh, population at the Western Galilee. Actually, uh, the introduction in the Western Galilee stopped a few years ago because we don't need to put any more uh, uh, deers into that area. Uh, another project started a few years ago in the Upper Galilee and the Carmel Mountains in order to uh, release animals there and allow them to join the others which are all away, already in the Western Galilee. Um, some of these projects are less successful, some others are much more successful. The one, for example, in the Upper Galilee suffer from problems like wolf predations. Wolves are now uh, uh, enlarging the distribution in Israel. Uh, we are happy with that, but the Persian fellow deals are less happy with that. So some of them are being predated right after the lease. There are others which are uh, uh, now acclimatized and then released in the Carmel Mountain. And uh, it's quite nice to see when you are hiking or picnicking at the Carmel Mountain, suddenly to see a uh, Persian fellow deers. And it's uh, quite an uh, impressive uh, uh, opportunity. And there is also a project which started at uh, 2005 in the Jerusalem Mountains. At the beginning, unsuccessful. Today, a very successful project. It's run both by the Jerusalem Zoo, the Nature and Park Authority, and of course we uh, help by monitoring these animals. And uh, today um, there is a second and even third generation live in the Jerusalem mountains. And uh, I live where they are being released and I know from my neighbors that they are more than happy to see a deer on the road or next to the road. And everyone are really uh, enthusiastic about the, the fact that these animals are back to the wild, back to the Bible land in Israel. Okay, so uh, we are jumping now into the second group of animals. This time it's not one species, it's a group of animals. And those are the bats. And I know that everyone are mentioning now the bats in uh, re reference to the coronavirus spread. I'll be happy to answer questions later, but uh, you can understand that uh, Bats are my, my beloved ones, so <laughs> I cannot blame them for anything. And later on, I, I'm sure that I can convince you if a question will arise. Right, sorry. So we have 33 species of bats in Israel. Actually, each uh, one third of all the Israeli mammals are actually bats. If you'll ask Israelis how many species of bats exist in Israel, they will tell you maybe one or two because everyone are familiar with the fruit bat, the Egyptian fruit bat, which is quite large. It can get into 70, 70 centimeters in, in a wingspan. And everyone can see it, and it also makes uh, the surrounding area very dirty because they are pooing and even uh, littering on, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, sides of building, on cars, and creating quite a mess. You know that maybe you know that Tel Aviv is called the white city, because the paint on the, on, the, on the buildings was white. 
the same was because now it's quite dark because of the poo of these beds. But uh, most other people in Israel will not know that we have 32 species of Michko chiroptera, meaning uh, insectivore beds, very tiny creatures that almost hardly can be seen, and most people are not familiar with them. All species, today we, I can say all species, because until last year, the food bed was extended from this uh, uh, categorized, but now all species are being protected, and 30 species out of the 33 are at a risk. Some of them very high risk, risk for extinction, and others close to it. So we have a lot of work in order to preserve these uh, animals. So uh, we'll start with the Egyptian food bed. Egyptian food bed, the one you can see here in cave, all these shiny glowing eyes are the eyes of the food bed. And there is a close up of uh, more, uh, uh, more combined group together. Food beds, when uh, uh, Henry Baker Tristram visited here in the 19th century, he mentioned that he knows that there are food beds here, but not as many as we are familiar with them now. And the main reason why the population go so big and so tremendous in numbers and distribution is because uh, here in Israel, we feed them, we feed them a lot. When uh, Henry Baker Tristan visited Israel, there were very few uh, uh, food trees which were here and most of them gave food only the summer. Today, in each garden, in each uh, open area, we are planting trees. We want our environment to look very European. We love fruits. So there are a lot of uh, agriculture enterprises and also people are raising fruits in their own gardens. And for fruit beds, it became heaven. So the numbers increased so dramatically that uh, around the 60s, the 70s and the 90s of the last century, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture decided to uh, try and uh, eliminate the population by using pesticide like this toxin, a very, very harsh uh, material which is known to kill pesticides, but also to kill all kinds of bats. So for many years, this poison was spread out in caves, in old buildings, killing a lot of bats. And I'm not talking about only food bats, but all species of bats. But we just read the Agadah. And the Agadah in Passover says that uh, the Jews, as long as you terminate them more and more, that's how they are spreading more and more. As it says in the Bible, in the, in the Agadah. And the same goes with the Egyptian food beds. They were try, people tried to poison them, but they bred. They bred beautifully. Twice a year, they spread out, and you, now you can find them almost everywhere. So they were almost intact uh, by the poison, but other beds did. And until now, 40 years after it stopped, we are still recovering from this catastrophe. But food beds are uh, found almost everywhere now in Israel, whenever, wherever there are, there are foods from the desert to the northern part of the country. They are quite visible, quite noisy, and you can always see them at the entrance to caves and not to the caves because they are not using echolocation in a good way. Their echolocation, the way to maneuver in dark, is based basically on vision. So if it's too dark, it's not good for them. So they are kind of, kind of uh, animals that love to sit in the dark, but not in a very dark areas. Other species are the insectivore bats, uh, what we call in uh, professional language, microchiroptera. Micro is tiny because most of them are very, very tiny. Actually, probably the, the tiniest mammal in the world is a bat. And the others are quite uh, similar in size. For example, this is called the greater mouse-tailed bat. What is greater? 20 grams. That's nothing. And that's the greater. So you can imagine the lesser, which is much smaller. These animals, uh, these bats, flying mammals, are being found all over Israel. Most of them use echolocation meaning using the sound that they produce and hearing the echo back in order to uh, um, find them the, 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 the route or the navigate even in very, very dark places like the inside of, of very uh, long caves where there is no light at all. And they can maneuver without no light using only echolocation, but they are not blind. Blind as a bat is a false 
false sentence. No bet that I know at least is blind. All of them can see, but they are trusting their echolocation more than their vision. But these bets are uh, representing fauna from uh, almost all our region around. For example, this uh, mouse bet, uh, they do love the desert. They really need the heat of the desert. So we can find them here during the summer when it's really, really, really hot, especially uh, alongside the, the Rift Valley. But uh, during the winter, we, they are going. We, are not, we don't know where, maybe to the Arabian Peninsula, where it's hotter, maybe to Egypt. They are sort of, uh, um, um, uh, forgot the name, the English phrase. Uh, uh, I'll remember in a second. But in any case, uh, these animals, these uh, bats, are found uh, alongside the Rift Valley in a very hot places. Uh, under 24 degrees, they tend to go to hibernate. They can hibernate for six months. And it's not a real hibernation like you know in Europe or in North America. They are staying awake, but they don't eat. They can fly. They don't really go to sleep, but they're not using any energy. They're using only the food and especially the fat that they manage to get during the summer. Here we can see definitely two males, quite nice. Actually, it's not a male, it's two females. I'll tell you later if you want why I know, although you can see some similar uh, shaped penis. The creatures which are coming from the desert and you can find them especially in the Arabian Peninsula and even uh, uh, all the way back to Egypt on the border of Africa are the Acelia tridents or the tri trident leaf-nosed bat which are very sensitive. We can find them in uh, colonies, which contains only females, like this one with, with a cub. You can see the female, the adult one is rich. Okay. I will not use my pointer. It says that it in, interferes with, uh, the, with the sound. Okay, so the female is reddish. The young, young born is uh, grayish. And uh, usually they have a very uh, social, social life, which are quite interesting. Males and females mate and then separate. So you can find colonies of females with cubs and males separated from them. They also stay here during the summer. They love the very hot climate of the Rift Valley, 40, 45 degrees, they love it. And then when it becomes cooler, they go, they are gone. They're going probably to a much uh, uh, hot place, hotter places, maybe the Arabian, Arabian Peninsula, maybe in caves in Israel, which are uh, much uh, hotter, and they stay there. We, are, we don't really know exactly where they're going to. But from the other end, we've got species which are unique to a very small region of Israel, which is the Hermon Mountain. We have two species of bats, you'll see them in a minute, the second one, which we can find only at the Hermon Mountain and they represent the fauna of Europe. And uh, they love cold weather during uh, uh, the, the summer, cooler weather during the summer. And again, we don't know what they're doing in the winter, but they're probably going to hibernate, a full hibernation. This species, for example, the Miotis mistakinus, we are not sure whether the Latin name is correct because uh, uh, now there are uh, rumors and information that coming from researchers that maybe what we have in Israel is quite unique, closer to the relatives in, uh, in Turkey, and not to the species we thought it should be uh, familiar with, which is in uh, Northern Europe. So this species found only in Europe, and this individual, for example, was caught during a survey in the Banias. Banias is a nature reserve at the northern tip of Israel, next to the border with Lebanon. Another species which is known in Europe, but in Israel found only at the Hermon Mountain in the surrounding area, is the Savi, the Savi Pipistrelus, sorry, the Savi Iposugu, which is also found only at the Hermon Mountain, and it's uh, the region around it, and you can see we call it the Zoro, Zoro bit, because of the mask that he, the black mask on his face, a very beautiful bat. The size, by, by the way, is about four grams, four to five grams. It's nothing, very tiny creature. And it's always amazed me that this tiny creature live for a long period of time, up to 30 years, which is quite amazing. You don't expect animals which are that small in size to live such a long life. 
We have also species which are representing the Mediterranean fauna. Uh, some of them are very, very uh, uh, common in uh, all our neighborhoods. For example, uh, do those two species, the Tadarida tenitulis and the Pipestelis cooli, are found actually in homes of our own local homes and houses all over Israel almost. Uh, I've got, I know neighbor, neighbors of mine that besides the human population in their houses also host some of these bats. Uh, some of them are very useful to humans. Uh, for example, the coolie, the small bat on the right, uh, is uh, eating, for example, insects which are biting insects. So if, if we have them in our neighborhood, we are much more reluctant to have less bites by insects than uh, uh, people who don't have these, uh, 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 these uh, bats. So actually we can find them from Eilat to the Hermon in any neighborhood, every city, every moshav or kibbutz, they are found, both species are found there. The kuli is uh, hunting on a lower level. The uh, tadarida is on the upper level, up to 200, even 300 meters. And um, quite, quite known in Israel, not by the public, nobody sees them, they are so, so small, but uh, they are uh, very common and uh, are visible for those who know how to look for them. Bats in Israel are in danger. They are in danger for many, many reasons. Uh, the newly uh, introduced uh, danger is by uh, eat by wind turbines. Uh, today, there are many programs to install wind turbines all over Israel, as it's been done in North uh, America and in Europe. But uh, the experience in North America and in Europe tells us that this is a catastrophe. This is a sort of a, a trap for birds and bats. And the two only uh, uh, wind turbines uh, farms in Israel already uh, managed to kill a lot of our bats. And uh, we are struggling in order to, to make sure that if wind turbines will be uh, placed in Israel, the, the regulations for them will be such that it will minimize to minimum or even to none the uh, risk of collision between bats and birds with these uh, wind turbines. Another risk is predation, especially by house cats. The picture in the middle, for example, was sent to me by a cousin of mine, which have a colony of uh, Pipisterus schooly in her house. Uh, she was not familiar with it until I, by accident, visited her and, and saw that the, there are bats in her, in her house. Since then, she fell in love with them, and she's even uh, encouraged them to stay. But her cat did not do the same, and in one week, he killed 10 of these bats until she found out how to make sure that the cat will not do it again. But 10 bats that could live for 20, 30 years were killed in one week by a cat who didn't even want to eat them, just to kill them as a play. So uh, we are trying to uh, 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 tell people how to hold their cats in a more uh, responsible way, how to feed cats without making uh, any interference to the surrounding area. And in general, we prefer cats in house. I love cats, by the way, but not outside where they can kill other animals inside the house. Another thing that uh, is uh, problematic is caving and tourism in caves. And we are doing a lot of work with cavers, with all kinds of organization of cavers, people who are going to uh, travel in caves. These are remarkable people, uh, very fascinating people. They love this hobby or even profession. They are very professional in what they are doing and they really want to make sure that they are not harming anything. And part of it is uh, bats. We are, for one hand, using their experience inside the caves to know where bats are and what kind of species are where. But from the other end, we are telling them where and when to visit the caves without harming the bat population inside. There's also a lot of hope. One of the biggest projects which are really fond of is the project we are doing with the, uh, with the army, with the IDF, with Tsaal. And the IDF, for example, have uh, uh, many bunkers which are situated, situated on the Rift Valley uh, alongside the uh, Jordan River. They were once used in order to host uh, soldiers uh, protecting the borders from the side of Jordan. But now you know we have a priesthood treatment with Jordan, which is uh, very good one and very solid one, at least between the armies. And these bunkers were deserted. 
It was found uh, several years ago that bats are using these bunkers, but not in a good way because the ceilings are very smooth. So the uh, bats have no opportunity to hang up on the ceilings. And in order to make it a better house for them, we are being helped by the uh, commanders and by the soldiers of the Rift Valley Brigade, for example, taking over these bunkers, deserted bunkers, and place plasters and uh, nets and foam in order to make sure that the bats can, can hang up on the ceilings and use these bunkers in a better way. And this is a very remarkable uh, uh, project, which is very successful. From one year to another, we can see that bat populations inside these bunkers is increasing and increasing and increasing. And the soldiers really love this project. And uh, well, I cannot show you with a pointer, but here is, for example, are all the officers on the left, all the officers of uh, the brigade of uh, the Rift Valley. And on the right, the guy which is uh, uh, almost covered by the man with the keeper is the second in command for this brigade. And he left his position five years ago, but every year he calls me, how are the bets? How are my bets in the bunkers? So it's a fascinating project and I really love it. What we are doing a lot with bets, I think that we are uh, now the, we are meaning the SPNI, we are now the main uh, resource uh, for uh, information about bets. There are very few researchers who are doing bets research and even fewer which we are doing bet conservation. And we are doing surveys all over the country using a lot of uh, sophisticated materials like uh, uh, special microphones which are, are allowing us to, uh, to record the sound, which is in high, very high uh, uh, frequency, no human here can hear it. Uh, we can record the sound of the bats and by uh, um, analyze it, we know exactly which species of bats is where and when. And for example, this is a sonogram, a description of the sound on a way that is visible for us. And it allows us to do a, a, a research which is not interfering with the bats, just listening to them and know exactly which kind of bats are where. Another story which is uh, very unique is the story of our own very own unique species, recently described as a very unique species for us, which is the mountain gazelle, gazella gazella. Once before, three years ago, not more than that, it was considered as a species which has a wide distribution also in Jordan, in Turkey, in Saudi Arabia, now a research show that this is a species which is found only, only in Israel. So it's endemic, found only in Israel. It's endangered by the IUCN, this global conservation uh, office. And it's uh, endangered because there is a 70% decrease in the overall population between two decades, only two decades. Now we have something between four and 5,000 uh, mountain gazelles in Israel. 20 years ago, there were about 12,000, which is a lot. And we lost a lot of them, mainly because of uh, uh, diseases that occurred, foot and mouth disease, for example, hunting, poaching, and uh, also mistakes were done in the past. Today, we are focusing on conserving these species as a flagship species. For example, one of our flagship uh, project is the Gazelle Valley in Jerusalem a place where a population of gazelles used to live between neighbors of Jerusalem. The area where they lived was trapped by roads, by new uh, neighborhoods, and the gazelles were trapped inside. A very, uh, um, uh, very uh, uh, precise action done by the nature, by, sorry, by the SPNI and by the neighbors around this area developed into a, a park which is owned by the municipality and operates by the SPNI. And from the last remains of three gazelles four years ago, now there are more than 50. And in a minute, you'll see what we are going to do with this enlarging population. So uh, the gazelles are now considered as a flexive species by the SPNI. And uh, the reason is that uh, uh, by, by using it, by utilizing its needs, and by conserving these species, we are getting much more than just conserving one species. For example, we are keeping ecological corridors with, when testing for each corridor, if a gazelle can pass through the corridor or not. If a gazelle can pass, 
everyone can pass. If a gazelle cannot pass, many species cannot use it. And we are fighting to keep uh, ecological corridors between nature reserves and to leave open areas. And we are managing to do so. People understand, uh, especially decision makers, they understand what the gazelles needs. And if a gazelle is the need is accomplished, then of course everyone else are benefited by that. We are trying to uh, improve uh, the nature reserves. We have a lot of nature reserves compared to other countries in size, but it's not enough. We have, as you saw, we have a lot of fauna which we want to conserve. So uh, we have the initiative to enlarge some of the nature reserves already exist and to cre create new ones. For example, one which will be situated alongside the Jordan River from the Dead Sea almost to the Sea of Galilee uh, between the border fence and the Jordan River, which is the border itself. Today, this is a military zone. Nobody enters there, but the future is not uh, promised. We want to promise the future by keeping it as a nature reserve, not only in, uh, by fact, but also by legislation. Of course, we're also trying to promote anti-poaching regulations. People sometimes do not understand why we are against shooting, uh, I don't know, wild boars. But they do understand where, when we are talking about gazelles, nobody wants to see a gazelle being hunted. We also have, have, a, have a plan to supplement some of the population by transferring gazelles from the gazelle valley, the surplus animals which are breeding there quite intensively and quite successfully. And we have a project to do a, a translocation, move some of the animals to nature reserve and to protected areas and by that supporting the wild population of gazelles. The last species which I want you to talk, uh, discuss with you is the most elusive creature that uh, I'm familiar with in Israel. Sorry for not having too many pictures. These pictures were taken by a trap cam. We are using it extensively. These are uh, cameras which are placed on the field and are uh, operated by themselves. If someone moves alongside the camera, it will take a picture. We are using it a lot because it allows us to see the wildlife without interfering. And these uh, uh, elusive creatures, the otters, the river otters, were caught by these uh, trap cams. Um, actually, when we are saving for these animals, the best sign that we can find is that. And I know that uh, almost you cannot understand what I'm talking about, but this is a very tiny, that's the size, a piece of pieces, actually, stool, sheet which is placed on rocks near water, near the body of water. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, sign tells us, tells us that there are otters next to it. And how do we check it? Now you probably will laugh at me, but usually we are looking at it first and then sniffing it. Because if there is a very strong smell of fish, we know it belongs to an otter. And that's the way we are mapping where otters live because to catch them by vision, by sight, by moving, walking, and seeing them, they, these are nocturnal animals, very shy animals, usually stay in the water. It's almost impossible. But looking at the sign marks that they are leaving us, that allows us to see where otters are. And we are doing a survey at the past 20 years, every year going to the same locations, or to new locations which are reported by people who accidentally saw an otter or signs for otters, and we are marking in each location where and when and if we saw signs for otters. So all the green flags, for example, all the green flags demonstrate there was positive this year. All the red flags, it wasn't positive. All the signs of the cameras are uh, uh, stating places where uh, animals were uh, recorded by trap cams, as I mentioned before. Every place where you can see a very small symbol of an otter, that's a live otter that was seen by someone. And we are confirming that it's an otter and not something else. And only if it is confirmed, then it's marked. Why do we do with this survey, which takes a long time and a lot of patience? Because survey give us knowledge. And by knowledge of the reason why these otters are declining, we can find solutions. Otters in Israel, this is the most southern distribution in the world. The, these animals come from Europe. In Israel, they were once found all the way to the coastal uh, uh, sea next to Tel Aviv even. But in the past 30 years, the population is pushed away to the north and declining. And today we can find it mainly um, 
near the Jordan River, all the way from the Lebanese border through the Sea of Galilee and southern to the area of Bechan. Once they went from Bechan west through the uh, Emek Israel, the Israel Valley, all the way to the seashores of the Mediterranean, but not anymore. So finding the reason why they are declining will give us information is maybe help us solution. And one of the simple solution that was found during this survey, for example, is a bridge. And it's ridiculous maybe to, to understand, but this is, for example, an area where the Jordan River is being placed between uh, concrete canals in order to uh, collect it and then use it for, uh, um, uh, to create uh, electricity, at least in the past. Now it's not been used by using a, a, fall, a waterfall that create electricity. But uh, the stream at the, this point is very, very harsh. So especially during the winter, where there is a lot of rain, uh, otters try not to swim at these rivers because they also might drown. So they prefer to go up and cross roads on the ground, and especially in places where the uh, river is very narrow. So a very simple solution, like the bridge you can see on the left, which is placed above the water level, but very close to it, allowing the otters to use this bridge and jump from one place to another without the risk of being, for example, road killed by cars as it used to be before. Every time that we placed such a bridge with cooperation, full cooperation of, of course, the Nature and Park Authority and uh, the, um, uh, the authority which is responsible for highways, every place where such a bridge was used, the road kill decreased, sometimes even vanished, and many animals were saved. That was a poor, that uh, solution came out from knowledge from our surveys that uh, gave a, a hint of what, are kind, what kind of solution can be used in order to protect these uh, animals. So with this uh, positive uh, uh, almost finish, and, uh, I was very pleased to uh, talk with you, although it's talk to the screen and not to you, but uh, now I'll be very happy to answer any question that will always raise up. And uh, again, thank you for all your help, all your support. It is really, really important for us. What we are doing here is not only locally, it's also help to conserve animals all around our regions. And uh, we need this help. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Shrilik. Um That was really fascinating. I really enjoyed that. I didn't even know um, about the uh, otter uh, bridges um, that you talked about at the end. Um, so we have uh, lots and lots of questions and I'm just going to um, I'm, I'm just going to start uh, reading them out and you can start answering them. Um, I'm just going to remind everyone that uh, before I do that, that tomorrow at uh, four o'clock Israel time, we're going to have a um, live uh, uh, ringing from the Jerusalem, from the Nidhi and David Jerusalem Bird Observatory. So we can hope you, uh, you can all join us for that. And then next week, we've got um, another two lectures. We've got a live uh, virtual tour of the Gazelle Valley that Shmulek mentioned beforehand, and also a talk from Amanda Lind about uh, Israel's wildflowers. Um, anyway, without further ado, we have about 20 questions, and we'll just uh, go through as many of them as um, Yeah, but, uh, and I can see some of them already. I opened the chat. Oh, and the go. first one is quite interesting, if you want, if it's okay with me. Um, by the way, I was, uh, the voice was interrupted. It was cut or? Uh... No, it was all right. Yeah. Just whenever you move the mouse, it, um, okay. it, it, so went, I'm, you I'm not, I'm not touching it even. Okay, yeah, so, so. so there is a question. Is there a problem with a white nose syndrome in Israel, like in North America? A white nose syndrome is a fungus which attacks the bats in North America, and it actually kills a lot of bats. It probably distributed by uh, humans by cavers, by researchers, like me. But uh, we are not familiar with this disease in Israel, not at the moment. I think it also depends on climate. There is still a research going on on it. Uh, we never found a white nose syndrome in Israel, and I really, really hope that we will not find it ever. Because if that, uh, it might kill the population here, and it uh, will be a catastrophe. Do you want to keep reading or should I read some out to you? Uh, okay, you can continue if you'll find something that is interesting. Right. How many different types of deers are there in all of Israel? Today, there is only one. The, only the Persian fellow deer is being reintroduced. There was an attempt to reintroduce the roe deer, but unsuccessful. 
the population which was brought to, uh, to the Chaiba Preserve was brought from uh, uh, Central Europe, actually from, from Hungary. And they are not suitable for release in a uh, uh, very warm climate. So uh, it was stopped unsuccessfully. There is, uh, I think, one or two individuals that may be, may be alive in the area of uh, Mata Nadiv, which is south and of, uh, or south, uh, south, south and of uh, the Carmel Mountain. But uh, there are uh, things, there are thoughts about maybe bringing some animals from Turkey, which is a closer population and maybe doing it, doing it in the future. But I think that first of all, we have to focus on the deer that is already introduced and still going on, the Persian fellow deer. And uh, we've got enough time to maybe enlarge it and bring another species later on. Um, what is, I see a question here from uh, Rosalind. What's the difference between a gazelle and a deer? Uh, okay, these are completely different families. The deers, for example, females have no antlers at all. In Ibu, actually, it's more problematic because we are saying Karen. Karen is an antler or a horn, it's the same. But in English, there are separation. So deers have, females have no antlers at all, and males have antlers, which uh, grow up every year and then fall back and grow again. Uh, gazelles are uh, from the bovine family. They are closer to uh, um, ibex, they are closer to goats, sheep, and even cows and they have horns, which are always on the head. Uh, both males and females have the uh, uh, horns. Males are larger horns, females smaller horns. So they are uh, relatives, but from different families. Okay, um, I'm just seeing what other... Okay, so I've got one, I guess, one more question on uh, the deers uh, before we move on. Uh, what um, did, I guess, the, you guys and the authorities do to minimize uh, genetic inbreeding between the, the, cat, the uh, released uh, this is from no, David. no way to do so. The whole population, the whole world population, is been uh, it's all collected from Iran from very few individuals. The diversity is very low. The genetical diversity uh, actually they are resemble in ninety six point six percent I think from in the population. Uh, the genetic analysis of DNA fingerprinting. So actually we have no options to uh, increase it from, by bringing animals from the outside. They're all relatives. So the only way to maximize the diversity is by time. There are mutation all the time. We can see the generation after generation after generation, they create a distance, which is needed. But unlike with other uh, animals, we have no other options. That's what we've got, the only ones. Right, um, okay, actually you can see one more question from Paul about uh, deer and gazelle. What are their natural predators? Um, the gazelles or uh, the deers? Both. Yes. Both, Both actually. Deer okay. and um, gazelle. In Israel, uh, let's a let's little bit uh, discuss both species uh, together, but uh, there are many enemies. They are predated uh, species, um, starting by wolves, uh, dogs, feral dogs. This is the most dangerous enemies that they've got, predation. It's not even a real predation because it's a uh, it's, a, it's not a wild animal. It's animal introduced or introduced and not controllable. And in some places, especially in Judea and Samaria, they just butcher the gazelles everywhere. So feral dogs uh, are very uh, risky to, uh, to the gazelles and also to, uh, to the Persian fellow deers. Uh, youngsters can be killed by a large variety of carnivores, starting even from the small jackals, a jackal cannot predate on a large, for example, a, a large male a Persian fellow deer, but it can uh, predate on uh, phones. Um, even uh, wild boars, when wild boar uh, meets a, a very young uh, gazelle or a deer, it can eat it, and they do so. So actually there are a lot of uh, animals that can uh, be uh, nature enemies, but uh, that's part of life. So what we are trying to do is especially focuses in uh, animals which we bought and not wild animals. So controlling the feral dogs and uh, other animals which are introduced by us. And if uh, a, a gazelle is being killed by uh, a hyena or uh, mainly by wolf, that's part of life. Um, okay, so we've got, um, well, I think we're gonna move 
um, onto questions about wolves and predators. Um, so we've been um, asked um, lots of questions. Uh, what are the main like carnivores living in Israel? I think was I think that's a good place to start. We lost some of our carnivores. Let's face it. Uh, we lost the lions in the 12th century. We lost the cheetah. We had cheetahs in Israel. I don't know if you are familiar with it, but in the 1960s, the last one actually was found in 1959 near Eilat. Uh, we lost the bears somewhere at the beginning of the 20th century. We had a, a, a Syrian brown bear in the northern part of the country, and we lost it at the beginning of the 20th century before Israel was established. So today, our biggest carnivores are the wolves, the hyenas, which are not really carnivores, they are scavengers, but this is the larger carnivore in terms of uh, systematics, and uh, the population is increasing actually. Uh, we have small carnivores, like three species of foxes, not only one, three species. Some of them are very, very unique and endangered. Uh, jackals, golden jackal, and uh, also other small uh, carnivores like the badgers, the honey badger, the uh, um, beach mountain, and so on. Mongoose. Okay. Um, how, uh, Russell asks, how many wolves are left and where can you find them? We have two populations of wolves. I can never tell you how many because uh, even if we count them, we cannot count everyone. So we have estimations. So uh, I, I can give a rough estimation, hundreds of wolves, uh, two populations which are quite distinctive to sub, uh, subspecies, one of them in the south, which is called south, which is quite smaller than the ones in the north. Uh, population of the northern wolves is enlarging, going west to the Western Galilee. They were not familiar, we are not familiar with wolves at the Western Galilee until five, six, seven years ago. Now there are many of them there. And the ones from the south uh, are reaching Jerusalem. They are very close to Jerusalem. So population is increasing, especially in distribution. But uh, we also think that in, uh, pop in uh, numbers. Um, okay, um, there's a question which I'll answer, um, which is, do, does SBNI offer tours? And the answer is yes. We have um, a tour hopefully um, in November if international travel clears up. And uh, I would highly expect we have one in uh, March uh, 2021. And both, uh, both uh, details can be found on our website, which is www.natureisrael.org. Um, okay, back to Shmuluk. Um What about the badgers? What about anything? Can you tell us anything about uh, badgers? You're asking about the the honey badger, I guess. No, no, no. The the black and white one, the Eurasian badgers, the European <laughs> badgers. No, both this of them are black and white. Both of them are called badgers. They are completely distinct species. We have two species. One of them is the European or the common badger, which is uh, you can find also in Europe in large numbers, and uh, it's a Mediterranean animal. You can find it in in good numbers in many places. The other one is uh, on the brink of extinction, it's the honey badger. This is an animal that comes from Africa and India and uh, used to be uh, common in Israel, almost went extinct. Now we can find it only in the southern part of uh, Israel, very rare. I never seen one, I never seen one in the wild. Uh, I've seen pictures, I've seen trap camps pictures especially, but uh, this is a species which uh, we really want to conserve and find ways I think that the problem was uh, mainly um, um, poisoning by uh, bees, uh, bee, bee growers, bee uh, um, farmers. And uh, now there is much more uh, um, um, knowledge by these bee farmers that they shouldn't harm any budgets anymore. It was done 30 years ago. We see the results now. And I hope that one day the population will uh, gain back uh, into what we used to know. Okay. I see there is a question, what are the opportunities for volunteers? Um, there are many opportun opportunities, for example, at the Gazelle Valley, all the year round they are working with volunteers. Uh, other opportunities are to join us with surveys. For example, at the first week of July, we are always doing a survey of bets in uh, the north part of the country. It's one week, which is quite extensive, going from one cave to another. And if so, one of you is, uh, is in the neighborhood, just Give me a call and I'll try to uh, put you on the list. 
Um, I remember very much going to visit Schmidlik for the back uh, for the, one of the bat surveys, and it was really, really excellent. It was um, a public event, and I took uh, my wife, and we had a great time um, stroking very, very cute, very Egyptian fruit bats. A happy day. Um, okay, so talking of bats, we have lots and lots of questions about mm -hmm. bats. Um, obviously, um, uh, lots of questions. I told you they are be uh, my beloved ones. <laughs> I know. Um, okay, so lots of questions about um, bat, uh, rabies. Do yeah. Israeli bats have rabies? Rabies is present in uh, bats in uh, North America and it's present in many other places in South America as well. We never found rabies yet in bats in Israel, uh, but we are not taking any risk. So those who are working with bats, handling them, are now uh, uh, using vaccinations. I'm getting vaccination every two years against rabies. We are not taking any chance. So far, nobody was found sick. Nobody died, nobody, no, no bet was found carrying the disease, but it's, it's an option. So we don't take any risk. Uh, by the way, talking about the coronavirus, bets are very uh, residuals to, uh, resistant to uh, all kinds of disease. They have a very uh, nice mechanism that's, which allows them to stay in large groups in a very stuffed places together without uh, being infected by disease. Even for example, the coronavirus, the ones that we are talking about, coronavirus was always exist in bats. This uh, subspecies now, uh, or the, or the uh, st strain of virus which attack people is uh, probably maybe derived either from bats or from other animals, we are not really sure. The bats are not sick with the disease. So actually they can carry it without being sick. Their body is not uh, uh, fighting against it. And the main, the main problem that we suffer from is the outbreak of fighting of our body against the virus and not the damage caused by the virus itself. Bats are not doing so, so they stay healthy. And actually now the risk that uh, we are uh, trying to minimize is the risk or damage that can cause by us. Because if there is this strain of virus in Israel now, we don't want to transfer it to the bats. So for example, me as a researcher now, I'm not dealing with bats handling. I can count them flying in the air, but I'm trying to minimize catching them, handling them in order to prevent the risk that I will uh, move the disease to them. And it's been done all over the world. Um, even if they'll carry it, the risk to get it from bats back to humans is very, very um, poor. Uh, there is only almost any, uh, no chance. What happened in China is probably uh, because they ate the bats or kept them together with other animals, which then transfer the disease. So my recommendation, don't touch a bet unless you are protected, or unless you know what you're doing and protecting yourself, either by vaccination or using gloves. Don't take the risk to get rabies or other disease, but also don't take the chance to cause them damage. So it's better to see them, watch them, and ask for experts if, if necessary to do something. Well, Shmidt, you've, you've exposed me twice to bats. I need to wash my hands for like <laughs> half an hour now. Um, all right, okay, I have a, a really good question from uh, Michael here, um, who says, um, how can we protect the bats but still have wind energy? Um, the first thing is not to use wind, wind energy in, uh, in places where there is a chance of uh, harming bats, for example, near caves or in places when we are doing a survey before and find that there is a lot of activity of bats. The second thing is to uh, prevent uh, creating a sort of traps for bats after the wind turbines will be placed. For example, if a wind turbine is, pla is being placed in, in a place, we want to make sure that no lake or pool will be built next to it, which might attract the bats to come to drink or to feed on insects which lay their eggs in the pool. And the third thing, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, research done on uh, mechanisms to manage to stop the wind turbine's propeller if bats are coming next to the propellers. So uh, uh, there are uh, all kinds of radars and uh, models and uh, ultrasonic uh, recording systems. And if a, a rare species is approaching uh, the propellers, then they can stop it. It's a shutdown mechanism. Uh, but the main, main uh, solution is just to make sure that if we are using wind turbines, not in a place that might be dangerous for the, for the bats. 
So surveys before uh, even planning is the most important thing. Okay. Um, okay, I think this might be the la famous last words, but this could be the last question on BATS for now. If someone wants to learn more about BATS, where would be a good place to go? This is from uh, Lior. Uh, there are books. I don't know if it's in Hebrew or English. In, in English, there are many, many books. And some of them are covering our region as well. Um, I have a book not far from my hand, but I'll show it later on, uh, written by, uh, uh, by Christian Dietz from Germany, and he described all our species in Israel. And there are also uh, uh, books in Hebrew. And actually, a uh, recent one was published by Professor Eom Yomtov uh, two years ago, and it's got the latest, latest information of all our species of bats in Israel. And of course, always you can come and uh, meet us. And that's, uh, hands to hands is better than uh, just reading. Yes, um, that's true. I would just go. I would just go to your house. That would be the. Uh, <laughs> just, okay. Um, okay. So uh, Martin asks, uh, I've seen small piles of soil on the ground um, around the country, especially around Mother Serret in a wadi. Which animal is doing this? Well, there are a lot of a lot of options. Um, I'll tell you a story. Okay, we once uh, we are, we've done a survey in a Tivot. A Tivot is a North Negev city. And uh, the municipality wanted to uh, check the vadis, the streams around the city, which are dry streams, in order to make a sort of a list, what to conserve first and what later. And in one of these vadis, we found the tunnel, which was recently dug by someone. So there are two of us, both of us think that we know everything, of course. And one of us said, uh, it's a porcupine. The other one said, no, it's a, it's a badger. And we decided to solve the question by putting a trap cam on the entrance to this, uh, to this tunnel. And we found out a very nice story that actually there are three species living in the same tunnel. Probably one of them dug it, maybe the badger. And then uh, uh, the porcupine came and used it or even maybe created another room. And then later on, also a uh, fox started to use maybe another different room. So uh, we have all three species living in the same tunnel. So I can imagine that either a porcupine maybe, maybe badger, maybe fox, maybe all three of them together. Right. But they are common uh -huh. in Rosset, all three species. Okay. Could it be a mole rat? It depends if it's small. I, I imagine they're very large. If it's a very small one, just a tunnel, not a tunnel, just a, a oh. sort of a hill. It yeah. could be a mole rat, yeah. Right. Um, Saul asks, are there any issues about gazelles interacting with uh, landmines, uh, setting off landmines? No, no, they're not. Actually, landmines, it's the best for me. <laughs> Sorry for saying it. The best nature reserve. Nobody goes there. Nobody is entering it. And uh, these animals are not, uh, not uh, uh, blasting their minds because a mind should have a minimum weight on him and gazelles never reach it. So uh, for example, near the border with Jordan, now they are moving uh, mines away and uh, every time they're doing it, I, I feel like I lost another nature reserve. These are the best nature reserves in Israel. Dangerous to humans, problematic, I know, I know, but in terms of nature conservation, leave the mines. Um, okay, um, I have a question here. Will it be possible to um, reduce the number of wild dogs by releasing wolves instead? Um, no, they're consuming the same, uh, the same uh, resources. So it, 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 it will not help. In order to reduce the number of feral dogs, we need a lot of education. We need a lot of work, especially at Judea and Samaria, to prevent people from just throwing the dogs away, but not only there, also in our side, let's face it. And uh, uh, in some times, uh, also harsh terms, uh, meanings uh, should, be, should be used, like trapping, and in the worst case, even kill. I'm sorry for saying it, but in some places, we lost a lot of our very endangered fauna because of uh, large packs of feral dogs. But I think now, now that everyone understands it and uh, maybe there is a chance to decrease the numbers, mainly, 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 first of all, education, neutering, castrating. People should know that when they're taking an animal to their house, that is possible all the way.
Um, okay, thank you. Um, I have um, a couple of questions here about um, Nutria. Um, so someone, so Laurie said when she was vis visiting the, the Hula Valley um, a couple of years ago, she saw a large uh, invasive rodent swimming in the water. Um, is it a big problem? And um, what's being done to control it? In Nutria, Myocaster coipus, this is a Central America rodent, very similar to otters, but otters are carnivores and Nutria are rodents. They are considered as an invasive species in many, many areas around the world. Almost uh, all of Europe is covered with uh, Nutrias. They were brought to Israel at the beginning of the 50s in order to create uh, Yamulka, the, the fairy heads of the Hasidim. But uh, the ones, uh, the, the person who brought them here uh, forgot one thing, that uh, the fair is not going to be nice here because it's too hot. So after uh, this uh, initiative was of course failed, he released the animals into the water and now they are spread all over. Uh, the damage is mainly, uh, is less for uh, local fauna, it's mainly for local flora, meaning plants. And uh, most of the damage is being done in uh, uh, artificial uh, lakes and, uh, and uh, tunnels because uh, uh, Nutria is uh, digging into these tunnels and maybe collapsing the walls or uh, the, the sides of the pool. So um, in some places they are being trapped, in many other places nobody is doing anything. We want to make sure that they will not at least spread out to new areas and uh, maybe they should stay in where they are but actually no plans are being really done today in order to prevent it, unfortunately. And it's not the um, only invasive species which is problematic, unfortunately. Again. I know. Well, that, that's why they're invasive species, because they are problematic. Um, Elana asked, do we have ferrets in Israel, I guess, outside the pet shops? Uh, no, 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 we don't have ferrets. We have a very similar species, which is uh, the native one, the beech marten. Um, it's very resemble ferrets actually, uh, it's spreading out. The numbers are increasing and also distribution is increasing. And uh, I, I remember that I was reading a book uh, 20 years ago in Israel that says that uh, in Europe, these uh, beach mountains are also found on uh, attics, on top of the uh, houses. And at that time it was, okay, that happens in Europe, not in Israel. Today it's very common in Israel as well. You can find it, for example, in the mountains of Hebron, all the settlements there, have almost every house, have a beach mountain on his house, in his attics, and now we can find them also the Carmel Mountain, at the area of Zichon Yaakov, and in many, many other places, the northern tip of the Galilee, um, they are quite common. But they, they are resembling the ferrets, they are close relative of them, but this is a wild type. Uh, Benjamin asked, are there wild ass and oryx successfully yes. uh, breeding in the Negev? Yep. Okay. The wild ass is one of the first um, projects. Mm -hmm. And they are increasing in numbers and in distribution. Actually, you can now just going uh, around Mitzpe Ramon, for example, and see a lot of them roaming around. To those of you who don't know what a wild ass is, it's like a donkey, but almost twice, trip, the double in size. Uh, in Israel, they used to live a, a subspecies called the, the Syrian wild ass. It was extinct completely. There are no, no residuals everywhere in the world. But uh, Israel bought uh, two subspecies which are close from uh, the area of Turkmenistan, Kulan and Onagar. It's a hybrid, a mix of two subspecies, but one species, but two subspecies. And uh, now the numbers are getting larger and larger. Actually, the, they stopped reintroduction because there is no need. It's a very su successful project. Arabian uh, oryx is an oryx that uh, also uh, almost extinct uh, all around uh, the neighboring countries. It was collected, the last uh, animals were collected in Oman at the beginning of the 60s. Both the Phoenix, Arizona uh, managed to breed there and then distributed back to zoos and also for reintroduction projects starting from Oman, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and also in Israel. In Israel, the project continues. Now there are uh, many herds of uh, Arabian oryx, mainly at, uh, near the Arava Valley, uh, but it's still going on. So uh, they are still critically endangered because it's not a stable population, but I'm sure it will be because there's some of these uh, release areas are, are quite successful. 
Um, okay, I'm going to go with uh, three last questions. Um, thank you, everyone, for sticking with us. I, um, over half the participants are, are still here listening uh, to you, wow. Schmuck. Um, Barbara asks, "What's the question? Uh, sorry, what's the picture behind you on your wall? What's the landscape behind you?" Uh, <laughs> this is a. Uh, this room is a, what we call the mamad. It's the security room in the house. Every every modern house in Israel now have a room which is a shelter in case of bombing. So it's very really quiet. But this is the room of one of my uh, kids. And there are two pictures. One of the scenes is from Vietnam. We had a trip uh, several years ago together as a family. Beautiful place. And the one on the left is from a basketball team that we love, Apoel Jerusalem. So <laughs> this is his room. Fair enough. Um, when, uh, Suzanne asks, uh, when was the last uh, leopard uh, seen in Israel or recorded? Good. Wow, that's a, first of all, the last leopard that was seen in Israel was caught on the 1st of April this year, meaning two weeks ago. Every year, someone on the full days raise a, <laughs> raise a, raise a story at the Facebook saying, I've, saw, I've seen a leopard, someone saw it, and it's false, I, unfortunately. But every year, the same fool comes again and again. Um, the last uh, uh, leopard that is for sure was seen in Israel was more than 10 years ago in Zdebokel. It uh, got the name Masayach, Mashiach, because they, mm -hmm. the ones who caught him that time thought maybe, maybe there's a chance to see more of him. But uh, unfortunately, I cannot uh, be, uh, have good, uh, good answers to that because nobody saw a leopard in the past 10 years at least. Well, let's say a couple words about cats in general, Russell has asked. Cats in general? Yeah. Feral cats or domesticated cats? No, no, the, the, the wild cats. The wild cat. We, have, uh, we, we used to have the cheetah extinct. We used to have the leopard probably extinct, probably. This is one of the species of the 100 maybe still exist. Uh, we do have uh, jungle cats and it's beautiful cat, larger, almost double the size of, uh, of domesticated cat. And uh, you can see it all the way from the northern tip of Israel, almost to southern of Be'er Sheva, alongside the uh, uh, water bodies, the sources, all the way to Gaza, for example, Gaza Strip, um, in small, small colonies, separated, isolated, but still exist. Um, we used to have the sand cat, the last population extinct, not because we killed it, because the area where they used to live went to Jordan on the peace agreement with Jordan. So uh, now we have the jungle cat and maybe, maybe feral cats. There is always a debate between uh, researchers if we still have feral cats or not, because uh, maybe they hybridized with uh, domesticated cats. We are not sure about it. Okay, and um, a last question from Sandy uh, to end on a positive note. Um, ah, in the Caracal. Sorry, the we still notes. have the Caracal. Forgot, almost forgot about it. Beautiful animal. Actually, the... Two years ago, one observed not, not far from my house, which is beautiful. I was worried um, that it wasn't a cat. <laughs> it's a big cat, almost a leopard. Wow. Um, Sandy asks, um, have, we, have you seen um, any uh, change in mammal behavior since everyone's been uh, inside for the last few weeks? Um, everyone asked me that. I think that it's, uh, it's a very short period of time. So uh, actually I went to the field today, for example, and you can still see people hiking. People feel safer in the wild, in the nature. And actually it tells us a lot how much we need nature. It's not enough to have a city. It's not enough to live in a good house. It's not to have enough to get the food and salary. We need the salary for the mind and for the heart. And part of it is nature. So people are escaping to nature. So I believe that uh, we will not see a very radical change in the near future, maybe later on. Uh, I do see something that uh, maybe is even encouraging. At picnic areas, for example, you don't find any food leftovers. So people are not, even if they're going to the wild, they're not doing picnics as they used to be. So there is less food for uh, uh, animals which are now in larger numbers than they should be, like jackals. So they have to, uh, get along with what nature gives them, provide them, and that's good. So I hope that will last, but I don't see any very drastic changes. The very drastic change for me was the capability of listening to the wild, because there were always the sounds of cars and trucks and 
moving machines, and suddenly I go to the wild, like today, to the nature, and it's quiet. You can hear the tortoise going on the field. It was amazing. Wow. I even caught today a wild boar sleeping, and it was napping wow. in the middle of the day, not knowing that I was coming, and I, I uh, didn't see him as well. So we had to meet face to face, five meter one to another, and well, my, my courage went away when he start, started to make a, the attempt to attack, but it was always a play. It's not a, it's not a real attack. So he ran away at the, at the end, but it was that quiet. Wow. Um, I think we'll wrap up the questions there. We still have, um, I, we still have over 160 people uh, listening in to us. Um, so Shmini, we'll definitely uh, have you back. And there, again, there, 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 a hundred of those people had questions also. What are we going to do about that, Lawrence? I'll try to, if you can we'll, keep it, we'll I'll do, try we'll to answer it. Answer with Shmilik, um, we'll do like a full um, question answer with Shmilik, uh next time. There, there's Great. a lot of questions and uh, hopefully we've, we've uh, covered most of them in some way or another. Um, yeah, just Jay. Wrap up. Thank you very much, Smaller, for this great talk. Thank you, and hope to uh, have another opportunity to talk with you. Anytime. Maybe face to face. <laughs> anytime, anytime. And there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of uh, comments from all over the all over the world and all over the states, and all over Israel. That people enjoyed it. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Lawrence, for great uh, backup. Uh, and uh, tell people when tomorrow we're going to be at the JBO live. Um, yeah, so we'll be live tomorrow at uh, 4 p.m. Um, Israel time. And I have uh, my, my mask has gone um, totally pear shaped since I've been here. So I've, the, the times in not Israel time are totally wrong in the emails, but the links are good. Um, so we we'll hope people see a lot of you uh, tomorrow morning, uh, New York time, uh, America time, uh, or 4 p.m., definitely 4 p.m. Israel time uh, in the afternoon. So I think that's about 8 o'clock. 9 a.m. 9 a.m. in New 9 York. 9 a.m. 9am right. in uh, New York, so uh, that should be great. And uh, if not, we'll be back uh, next week um, at 6pm uh, Israel time for a virtual tour with the Gazelle Valley. And uh, we'll be sending out uh, reminding emails uh, to everyone um, in, the, in the next week. So hopefully uh, you'll join us and spread the word. Great, great. This has been the Hebra Laganata Teva, the Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel. Coming to you live from Suradasa and parts around Israel. Thank you all very much. Awesome. Awesome. Everyone, uh, stay safe and Hag uh, Sameach and Happy Easter. Um, and Nancy's asking, what's a JBO? It's a Jerusalem Bird Observatory, so it will be a uh, live bird ring tomorrow. Um, so uh, should, who knows what they'll find. Um, but uh, last week they had sparrowhawks, rhinox, and siskins, I think. So it's actually... People really, are asking, really what does the JBO that. means? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah just, the J yeah, the JBO is the uh, Jerusalem oh. Bella Observatory. Um, but yeah, so thank you, everyone. There's lots of thank yous to you, Shmedek. So um, from England, um, various parts of America, I think someone from Iraq was listening, um, Europe. So it's great. Thank you, Shmedek. All right. Bye, everyone. Happy See you Easter. all tomorrow. Happy Easter, Moadim Lissimcha. Good week right. to all. Yes. All right. Bye, everyone. Uh, and